I think the public starting to realize, hey, there's a problem here, and a lot of it has to do with policy. I really hope so. I think with the gas prices being what they are, it's, people have really refocused their attention to, wait a minute here, you know, this doesn't make any sense, and they're not stupid. People aren't stupid. You just heard Chad Hathaway from Hathaway LLC. Chad Hathaway is the owner and founder of Hathaway LLC. In 2011, 12, and 13, Hathaway LLC was named the fastest growing privately owned company in Kern County by Inc. Magazine and was named the Team Co. 2013 West Coast E&P Company of the Year. Chad is a co-founder, president of Kern County Energy Foundation and Eastside Water Management Area. Prior to starting Hathaway LLC, Chad spent several years in various oil and gas fields, learning operations firsthand. He also worked in the directional drilling business before founding PayZone Directional Services. This wide array of experience has provided him the knowledge and ability to gain a competitive advantage in the industry. Chad attended Bakersfield College and Cal State University Fresno, majoring in communications with an emphasis in business. In today's show, we discuss the oil industry in Kern County. And later in the show, we talked about how the oil industry and ag industry are friends in the oil industry is producing fresh water to the ag industry for many years. Welcome back to the Our Two Cents podcast, the show where your local professionals sit down with an array of guests to hear their story and impart some wisdom for both business and life improving skills. This is your place to hear business and community leaders discuss relevant topics that matter to you. And welcome to the show today. My name is Troy Burton. I'm your co-host to Our Two Cents Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Before we get into today's episode, I encourage our followers and listeners to go back and check out episode, or last week's episode. That would be 168. Uh, with Aaron Falk. Uh, He's a current president and CEO of Kern Community Foundation, which focuses on growing our community. Chad, we're happy to have you join us today. Thank you for being here. Can't wait to get into today some of the topics. I know uh, the big uh, focus is oil industry. You know, my roots is Taft. I started in oil patch, did my 25 years there, and I was kind of forced out because I seen so much change in the industry. And uh, you know what? I was talking to you before the show. And I believe if you live in Kern County, uh, you're in the oil business no matter what you do. And you're also in the ag business because oil and ag is Kern County. And it doesn't matter if you're selling burritos on the corner stand or frames at the marketplace. People that are buying those products are in oil and ag, and that is the core part of our community. I appreciate you coming on because your perspective is much broader than just an oil producer because you're in both ag as well as in oil. And uh, I, I appreciate your experience experience as well as your knowledge. I take my hat off to you because I follow you on LinkedIn and I see your probably weekly posts of certain uh, maybe groups that aren't real good friends of the oil industry and their perspective of the oil industry. And I appreciate your pushback and your passion to try to make change in this state. And with that being said, can you just kind of give us a small overview before we get too deep into our current state of uh, the oil industry in California? Uh, sure, Troy. Um, so just a little bit about Hathaway LLC. I, I own 100% of it. Um, we have about close to 300 wells here in California, from natural gas wells north of Sacramento, uh, heavy oil in, Cal- in Bakersfield, eastern Bakersfield, uh, all the way down to Arvin. I'm also a, a landowner in Kern County. I own you know, several thousand acres of land. I farm uh, about 150 acres of wine grapes um, and, uh, and heavily involved in water. We also do consulting for asset recovery, uh, asset optimization for other investors, large investment groups in our sector too. But more importantly, I was born and raised in Bakersfield, went okay. to uh, Compton Junior High, East High, All right. Bakersfield College, and then Fresno State. So I'm really proud of uh, where I came from, and uh, this community means a lot to me. And uh, ironically, most of our oil wells on the eastern side of Kern County, so I kind of never left the east side. So you're still, you're <laughs> still it, it's side. hard to pull the roots. It is, but I, I just love Bakersfield. And, uh, you know, my dad left the state, and, you know, we see a lot of people leaving the state. And, yep. and I always tell people, I'm going to be the last guy standing. Right on. I, I Like I said, I can, I can see the passion, and uh, you, you're right. I have a lot of oil-filled service-type accounts that I partner with and do business with. Mm-hmm. 
most discussion I've had in the last two to three years is how do we stay in California, but now operate in Texas and South Dakota and Utah and Wyoming, mm-hmm. because that's where the activity has been. And uh, their roots are here. Maybe their families here don't really want to leave completely. But it's uh, been the talk, you know, we've always heard that people are leaving California in the masses. And now I'm seeing businesses uh, starting to leave or at least uh, multiply into other areas just to be stable uh, through this climate that we're in. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that California is probably the hardest state to operate in. And I have no idea compared to what you do. But I read the headlines and uh, I have friends in the oil industry. And uh, like I said, we're all in the oil industry. But, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I remember reading in the paper, actually working with an engineering firm that morning, and he threw the paper at me. We were having coffee over a discussion, and he goes, check this out. And it looked like the permitting process, uh, which kind of had stopped, had been moved to the uh, state level, probably Sacramento, and we've been fighting that in court, it looks like, for quite some time. And it looks like uh, we are favored to bring that back to more of a local-type government for permitting process. Is, is, is that close? Kind of shed some light on that. Yeah, no, the county took, uh, well, you know, we, it had been sued by primarily non-governmental organizations, environmental groups, and uh, also there's a local farmer that was involved in the lawsuit as well. But yeah, it, it had been tied up in court. Basically, what the county is doing is they're giving oil and gas producers, they did a countywide environmental impact report, which is like before you build anything, you've got to do an environmental impact report in California, which right. gives you what's called CEQA coverage. Well, yep. the county uh, went out and created a mechanism for that and created a pathway for us to uh, obtain drilling permits. Again, it still has to go through the state for partial approval, but the county is the lead agency, which is important. Another thing recently just happened, um, the California legislature, at the urging of the governor, passed a... Senate bill, actually it's a Senate, called SB 1137, which was a 3,200-foot offset rule, which means that a new oil well could not be drilled or worked over or it touched, basically, just basically it could be produced until it, it, it's abandoned within 3,200 feet of what they consider a sensitive receptor, which is a nightmare of a bill because it creates all kinds of conflict between real estate and oil and, and anybody or anything that, that any industry could see this as a potential red flag as being that, oh gosh, well, if you can't have an oil well 3,200 feet from a school, how can you have a farm 3,200? feet from a school how can you have a factory so everything becomes school? a sensitive sector everything's a receptor yeah and so basically we just uh and it was ironic the independent producers of california um really stepped up to the plate the majors didn't participate it was pretty shocking in my mind how little they did uh, to help in that effort but i guess they assumed that they take the legal route on that deal but right. we were able to raise the 20 million dollars or so and and uh beat back that for a couple of years. So we got a referendum on the ballot to stop that. So that was a big one that was going to affect a lot of us. Um, maybe not majors, not so much, but I think the uh, for us, it was important. So that would have been new permitting and new uh, activity, but existing would be fine, but uh, until basically went to idle and abandoned. Until you wanted to work on the well. And oh, even it's just a workover. Workover, yeah. It affected workovers too. Isn't it? Oh, so yeah. that could be a week, a month, a year. You, you never know. Well, it's two years out because it'll go hit the ballot. And if we win, the, it's like, like any ballot proposition. If we win it, which I think it'll be tough to win in California, then, then we'll repeal it. But, you know, we've just got a governor who is hell bent on destroying our industry. Yep. There's just no other words around it. He is hell bent on destroying the oil and gas industry in California. And he's bought a playbook for it, you know. The people at uh, Berkeley have built him a nice playbook, yes. and he's following it. You know, unfortunately, we could talk about climate change. We can talk about that, and you could take all the fossil fuels off the, you know, out of California. But you're still going to need oil, a lot of oil, for a lot of different things. And the thousands of products that we use that are made out of oil, the roads, everything from plastics to yep. polymers to rubber, you know, pesticides, herbicides, you know, all the different types of agrochemicals that are done, petrochemicals, you know, the mm-hmm. You name it, makeup. I mean, yep. everything is used. Paint. Paint. You name it. You can't You can't live without oil in today's society. You know, that's what blows me away. And I'm not a genius, but being in the oil patch and seeing the fight against the oil industry for so long and us talking about what oil really is, you know, and I don't want to jump on the electrical side of things because, you know, I'm not a big fan. I don't think it's reachable for us to do what they're even talking about. But even if we did, those electric cars have tons of oil products in them. As you just mentioned, roads and tires and plastic. I mean, it just goes on and on in everyday living. I think maybe you were on Moneywise show. I know you've been on many times. They're great friends of ours and part of us. 
and I think Dave was talking about a hospital room setting, maybe emergency room where the patient was in there and two or three doctors and, you know, they're working on this person and all the devices hooked up. And I don't remember the whole thing, but let's, let's just say there was a hundred items itemized and 93 of them were based on patrol built with petroleum products. That's in the medical world alone. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I get it. And, and I don't know the political stance besides people want a green environment because they think it's safer or maybe healthier or non-pollutant. I don't know the right word, but it makes no sense in California. I know the regulations, not like you do. The oil industry is the most heavily regulated industry probably in the world. It is. Let me back up and me address something you said. Why, why do people, what do people want? Well, people obviously want to live in a planet without pollution. I mean, they want to live a healthy life. They yeah. want to do that. But people don't think about Earth. I mean, people think of Earth as a mother. Well, Earth is an evil stepmother who wants to kill you and tries to kill you every single day. Whether it be lightnings, hurricanes, bad weather, heat, parasites, viruses, sure. or whatever. Earth, we're, Earth doesn't want us to live. They right. want, it wants us to die. And so, we could, if, however you feel about climate change, yeah, I believe that climate change is real. Do I believe what the man-made influence is? Do I understand what the models are? No, I don't because there's hundreds of them and none of them are right. Some are wrong, some are, some are right or closer to right. What is being used against society now is what I call catastrophizing. And Alex Epstein has really been a big guy. I don't know if you've heard of Alex Epstein, yes. but he wrote a uh, moral case for fossil fuels and he put, wrote a subsequent book, uh, Fossil Future, which is just out, which is an incredible book. Um, but, but people use catastrophe as a tool in order to scare you into climate change. And I think in a state like California, where we have, especially in our area, we have some of the highest rates of poverty in the state. Mm-hmm. We have the highest fuel prices. We have the highest electricity prices. And then we're talking about taking, making this great transition. And every road that we have to put an electric vehicle on is subsidized and paid for by gasoline and diesel taxes. Correct. So where do you get the money when you get rid of all those taxes? And we already have the highest electricity. We already have the highest fuel prices in the nation. How are you going to do this? This, this right. These goals are unrealistic, and the right. people we have leading the state are absolutely out of their mind. And I say that it's, it's a majority, and the majority makes the decisions, right? I'm not saying they're all that way. I get it. But, but they, they make the decisions, and there's, there's to me, there's just got to be some sort of alternative motive here that we're not seeing, you know, and I just don't, I don't get it, because eventually one day somebody's going to wake up, and either everybody's going to be gone, or, or we're, we're going to have a, a population that can't afford to go anywhere or do anything. No, I get it. I mean, we had Vince Fong on a couple months ago, and we were talking about uh, Diablo Canyon and how we've salvaged to keep that running and how we have been subsidizing that power uh, through our oil industry. And then just, uh, I don't know, again, another month ago, I just read that it's a tribal issue, but they're taking all these dams out of the Klamath River, which are hydro plants. I get it. I, I Don't get me wrong. I understand the native side of it, but as a, I as, don't. As, as a state... What do we, what are, where are we going to get our power? It's not solar. It's not wind. Yes, they are such a small piece. And I don't know about you, but I really don't want to see all these uh, solar panels in the county dump at some point and <laughs> all these batteries from these electric cars. And I just don't get it. And I read that California has the biggest reserve of oil anywhere in the United States. Not that we're tapping it, but we have those reserves. And I believe, you know better than I do, you do this every day. We're producing about 400,000 barrels a a day, and our need in California alone is 1.8 million. Does that sound about right? That's about right. And so I already know the answer, but let's talk about it. Where's the oil coming from? Well, we used to have a huge influx of oil coming from Alaska, but that's that's been depleted quite a bit, and not a lot of new development has been allowed in Alaska on the North Slope. And that Keystone issue was stopped as well, the pipeline, right? Yeah, but Keystone wasn't really necessarily feeding the West Coast. California is on a kind of a crude island, so we import about 60-plus percent of the oil that we consume every day. So I kind of feel like, and you probably do too, uh, Canada is kind of a domestic friend of ours for sure. Yeah. But how much foreign oil are we bringing into the country? And how's it getting here? In the country or California? California is 60 plus percent. Okay. And the majority of that oil comes from Saudi Arabia. It uh-huh. comes from Ecuador. And it comes from Iraq. And it comes, the, the top four are Saudi Arabia, Ecuador, Iraq. And well, it, it was Russia too. We have some Russian crude that was coming in too. Um, and then a whole handful of other foreign nations. But the majority and, and Chad, of Chad, my side. point is that's a really long pipeline, which doesn't exist. 
Yeah. So it's coming over on tankers. How are those tankers being powered? Tankers are being powered by bunker fuel, but it's uh, in which are emitting quite a bit of emissions. Which is diesel, right? Yeah, but let's back up and let's look at Ecuador and let's look at their environmental track record and where we're getting the oil from, which is yeah. the rainforest. And let's look at Saudi Arabia and their and their civil rights and, and human rights um, history. I mean, they sure. obviously we do not share the same values with any of these countries. Agree. Iraq, same thing. Um, we just, we don't share the values, but, but, but do we do share the values with your friends and your neighbors? Yes, we do. A lot of us all live on, pay the same taxes, do the same things, go to the same churches and schools, and we're the ones being punished. And it is frustrating. It's very frustrating. You know, I, I know from talk and people like you, but why is it that we are still a big oil producer as a state and our petroleum is the most expensive? I know there's taxes. I know we have alternative you know, fuels for our gasoline is more. Expensive. Yes, gasoline. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's frustrating. You know, I got friends in Oklahoma that I talk to, and they go, "Boy, I'm glad I'm not in California." I go, "Why?" Because all they read is the headline: oh, "California gas is six fifty, seven fifty. You know, mm-hmm. it's just it's it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't. It's it's our backyard. It's like you stick the shovel in the ground and you got oil in it. And why are we paying so much? Well, let's let's you know difference difference. I don't own a refinery. Um, majority of us don't own refineries. And the definition right. of an independent producer like myself is that you don't own a refinery. You're just strictly, you know, upstream. Yes. And so the governor right now is, is really trying to shift the blame of this to, to our industry. In fact, they're getting ready to roll out with a bunch of uh, hearings. And so I think it's more of a trade bait thing that the governor likes to use. But first of all, you've got, you know, dollar fifty plus in taxes. Take that straight off the top. Um, and that's, that's your, your taxes are associated with, uh, the price of a gallon of gasoline. You've also got in this state, you've got 14 refineries when we used to have 30. Yes. The half of what we had. So we have half of the refining capacity we used to have. We also have stringent rules and regulations that pertain to the blends of gasoline that are unlike anywhere else in the country. We have summer blends and winter blends, and it's very expensive to do that. And that's all at the behest of the California Air Resources Board. So in order to convert from one blend to the next, we shut down the refinery, got to rework the tool it, retool it. Pretty much, yeah. So there's a shortage, so gas spikes. And I'm not a refining expert, but, you know, imagine a refinery with all these working parts and pieces and processing. You have to shut it down anyways and do routine maintenance. Sure. And so you've got all that, also the winter blends, the summer blends, um, uh, which add, adds price to it. And then you've got the foreign impact of foreign oil and the cost of bringing in foreign oil, and you've got transportation of bringing in foreign oil. So that adds also to the cost of it. Um, and then you have the, the last thing is the cost to operate in California, a thing called cap and trade. Refineries pay a fortune to yep. operate in California. Anybody that's in the transportation business or anything like that understands this, that our cap and trade related fees and taxes are astronomical. And so that adds expense. The refiner has to pass it on. They're not going to be in business to sure. lose money. And then also the cost to insure refineries is astronomical in California. <laughs> You know, it's it's a cheaper uh, to do business, as we all know, in other states. It's yes. just a no-brainer. So the reason why gasoline is so expensive is because of the policies that have been put upon the refining industry by the state of California. And then, okay, the refinery's done with the product. How long does it take you to drive down the street and see five different prices of gas? Mm-hmm. You got Joe over here and Saeed mm-hmm. over there and Joey over there selling it for six fifty or six twenty or six thirty or whatever gas rush or fast trip or whatever. You yep. know, everybody's yep. got different prices. So the retail aspect of it also adds a premium to gas. Sure. If you say you own a gas station and you're in the oil business, you're not. <laughs> you're yeah. a profiteer. And I don't blame you for being a profiteer, right. but you're sitting there. And they've got to make money on that wholesale gallon of gas that they bought. And who knows when they bought it. And they're just going around their little regional economy, which whatever that corner is or area. That's true. Yeah. I'm like, just go to the corner of 7th Standard, or I'm sorry, Merle Haggard and 65. Yep. And then drive down the street to Olive Drive and see the difference in the price of gasoline. The retail guy is culpable guy. And most of these gas stations, 90% of the gas stations in this country are owned by small business owners. Yes. So go punish them. Yeah. If you want to get mad at some, so the governor's going to be coming out and it's big oil. This the big oil thing is getting to be a little bit, bit of a, a a dead horse. You can't really beat them anymore because I think the public's starting to realize, hey, there's a problem here, and a lot of it has to do with policy. I really hope so. I think with the gas prices being what they are, it's, people have really refocused their attention to. Wait a minute here, you know this doesn't make any sense, and they're not stupid. People aren't stupid. You know, but I read it and I don't really know the logistics of it. But yeah, there, there's a thing from Newsom going to, you know, go after big oil because their profit third quarter or fourth quarter, third quarter profits were 500% or, or even to a thousand. Okay. Price of oil is what, 75 to $80 varying? 
Yeah. Well, but you know what? When I got in the oil industry, 1989, $8 a barrel. Yeah. I mean, when I started, it was uh, 15 So it's had its voli- you know, volatility. And trust me, you've lost plenty of times too. Are you making a ton of money? Yeah. But it, it you know, it's a business. And, and where does the government have the right to step into any business and say, hey, Chad, I don't care what you do. You're building widgets or, or you're a construction guy. It doesn't matter what you do. Since when can they put a margin of profit on your business? Now, they did it in healthcare because that's what I'm in. And, and we figured out how to still make money and continue on. And don't get me wrong, it's broke. But in most cases, the government doesn't step into business and say, oh, you can be a doctor or you can be a gas retailer or you can be whatever, but your maximum percentage is X. It just it doesn't make sense. It's, it's true economics. And as you said, regulations and refining and taxation – uh, all drive up costs. So at the end user, you look at the guy at the gas station gouging you, there's 15 layers or if not 100 layers of of uh, economic impact on that. Well, you can't compare a guy like me to a super major. A super major has sure. refining capacity, midstream capacity, transportation, retail, wholesale. I just produce oil like a farmer and I sell it to a refinery. That's all I do. And if right. the price of oil is 75, we make money. And if the price of oil is 30, we break even. You know, that's just the way we do it. We're So there's a big difference in oil companies. And when they say oil companies, believe me, there's a, super majors are a small handful. And you know what? This business is extremely cyclical and it requires a significant amount of capital investment, which we have not done for several years. We have not reinvested in our industry. And now we are finally starting to return that money. So if you look at ExxonMobil and Chevron, I'll just name those two because they're the behemoths yep. in our country. Yep. They're one of the top yield dividend generating stocks in the country yep. and have been for a long time. They return money to their investors. Their investors are teachers. Their investors are healthcare workers. Their investors are government uh, employees. Yep. They, 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 they return a significant amount of capital to shareholders. And they've been doing that for year after year after year after year. And oil companies that have a good year, but they also have bad years. I've been in three downturns in my career three and how long you been in it 18 years okay three downturns and like you said the price of oil goes from eight in fact when we were in covid time april of uh yeah. 20 we went and uh, west texas went negative 35 right so i've seen oil in the in the tens here we don't live in this perfect business and we may have a couple good years but we also have to prepare for the bad years that's why i said at the beginning we were talking that you know balance sheet is so important to me to making sure we can survive the down and we're reinvesting back into our properties reducing our liabilities so when things go do go south again we're ready to be we'll be prepared for that and we're efficient and more efficient than what we were before but i really just you know like to point out apple yeah. microsoft yeah ibm okay. citrix you name it. The profit margin in those <laughs> industries is insane. Like yeah. how much money Apple is sitting on. And you don't see them getting drugged to the mud. Pharmaceutical companies. When you're paying $1,000 for an iPhone. But who's talking to them? And everybody you know has one. Yeah. And, and our, they can't wait for the next one. And our kids are sitting there sucked in like zombies being yep. numbed by an iPhone. And, you know, it's like, where are they at right now? Completely agree. Why don't you call Apple? That's a perfect example. And there's a whole handful of other tech companies out there that need to be talked to then. If that's the case, if it's not allowed to, if we're not, we're not allowed to be innovative and work hard and stick our neck out there to make a profit, then why is it? It's why we're doing this. Picking winners and losers, right? That's right. We want it. R&D and, you know, trying to make, make a living and provide uh, for a community and many families as you do as well. I look at you as kind of like a farmer, even in the oil industry, you may have a couple good years and then you... Going to have a few bad ones, too. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely better oil guy than I am a farmer, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in the wine grape business, right? Yeah, it's wine grapes, and we were pistachios for a while. And okay. uh, we sell water as an oil company. We sell water to uh, a water district in northern Kern County, and that's been a good business for us. I'm also uh, president of a water district, chairman of the water district, which we founded. Uh, it's not a, We're becoming a district. We're a management area now. And uh, also been on the board of the KGA, which is through that district. So been heavily involved in Sigma and how it's going to impact uh, Kern County. And, and so that's been a, I think, cool experience for me. I, I've enjoyed getting my head into water and, and also finding new opportunities for, for beneficial reuse in our businesses is, is, a, is a real fun project for me too. It's been a lot of politics around water. Obviously we've had a lot of farm people on here and uh, again, a lot of our customers are affected and state of California and water is it, kind of a, hand-in-hand hand discussion every time you decide to shoot the breeze with somebody. Tell me a little bit about you selling water. So uh, going back to my days, obviously you produce a lot of water when you're trying to produce oil. Yeah. 
in most cases, it's more water than oil. Oh, yeah, it's way more. <laughs> and in our case, it's 99 yeah. barrels of water yeah. and one barrel of yeah. oil. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say about 99%. But mm-hmm. um, so you run that through a uh, water softening program and talk the solids out and make it not necessarily drinkable, but palatable to irrigate. Is that kind of the mm-hmm. process of selling it? Or no. are you using it to sell it to maybe a power plant or something that's... No, we don't soften it um, at all. We just remove the organic. So the a unique phenomenon about Kern County is the eastern side of Kern County has a, a sequence of fresh oil, uh, fresh water oil fields. Kern, water flood? Uh, no, not water flood at okay. all. Um, Kern River is, yep. uh, is, a, is a fresh water oil field. Kern Front is a fresh water oil field. Mount Pozo has sections of it that are fresh water. Uh, Jasmine, which is I own uh, entirely. And your point uh, is, I'm Taft. So yeah. the west side is very salty water. Extremely when we say fresh, water. we're talking fresh. I'm talking fresh yep. from a standpoint of you can irrigate with it immediately. Wow. But you have to remove the organics from it, or you have to blend it with a little bit of, of, of like ag water to get it down to a nice matrix. So we remove the organics. If you start looking at dirtier water, like what you talked about, yep. you're looking at reverse osmosis, um, yep. ultrafiltration, um, not only re- re- removing the, the organics, which is oils and stuff like that. Oil is an organic, you know, yep. it's, it's a pure organic. <laughs> oh, it comes out of the ground. Yeah, it's, it's natural. It's, hmm, um, so we have to remove all that from the water. And so what we use is um, actually tiny air bubbles at high volume. And the air bubbles remove the, the final oil from it besides gravity and a small amount of organic chemicals. Um, use hydrogen peroxide actually in small doses to, to strip it out of the, our wastewater after it's been separated. We sell it to a water district, and the water district puts it in there, actually a lake or a reservoir, and 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 stores it in the winter, and and uses it heavily in the in the in the high irrigating months. And so, what's unique about oil filled water being part of the irrigation mix is that it's considered new water, so it's not governed by sigma. So it's not something that's counting against or coming out of your groundwater. It's coming from a different aquifer. Interesting. An aquifer that's exempted, uh, federally exempted, and um, uh, it's not in the equation when it comes to to um, Sigma. So, so it is surface new, water. It's considered new water. Interesting. Yeah. So it's a very, very game changing component if, if, if really maximized in the right parts of Kern County. And I assume other producers, maybe even the majors are selling quite a bit of water. There's three of us, um, just recently four. Um, but there's, we've been doing it, uh, Chevron, the longest standing discharger is Chevron. Second longest is myself. Third is CRC. Mm-hmm. And fourth is a company named EMB. Just started doing a, a small project in uh, Pozo Creek. Very interesting. I didn't know that. I thought it was all nasty produced salt water. No, in fact, you, you can. Uh, the the Kern River oil field is the biggest uh, actual agricultural water provider in Kern County, and they provide almost thirty thousand acre feet a year to a Coelho Water District. That's very interesting. It has for forty, almost fifty years. I think it's wow. been a long time. So let's talk permitting so we talked about the permitting going from the state level to the county level will we see some activity yeah i think so i mean from my standpoint um we we look at the next two years window as a as an opportunity to really just get a heck of a lot done and then kind of sit back and, <laughs> and chad watch the it. process if you and i said today hey we're, we're going to drill 10 new wells this year mm-hmm. and today we decided we're going to do it we have the financing let's move forward so we're going to i guess draw up and, and request for permitting and mm-hmm. i know there's a lot of stuff i'm very i'm i'm flying over very high view yeah how long until you can stick a rig on the on the ground well it's probably going to be 60 to 90 days um with current well that's permitting. faster than i figured it was yeah i think 60 to 90 days with with the current um uh, permitting back in place at Kern County is reasonable. There's probably a little bit of a backlog right now, so I'd give it six months. And when so. you do environmental impact, let's say we're doing 12 wells, you got to do one in each area, assuming those wells aren't going to be next door to each other? Well, or? the county already did the environmental impact report. What what It's an ordinance. It's like getting conditional use permit or something like that. So you just have to go in and make sure you check your boxes culturally, you check your boxes environmentally, and, you know, the bugs and bunnies. And then, uh, I mean, besides all, you're saying these wells are ready to go. None, all the engineering's done, all the geology's done, all that f- stuff right. like that. You know, that stuff is what we do all internally, and we keep them right. in inventory. But um, yeah, I, I, it, it's six months would be, I think, the top of right now. I think once the county gets cleared of this backlog that's been sitting there for a long time, it, it should get down a lot quicker. I would say thirty days or less. So I noticed the price of oil's been fairly fairly good uh, for a producer in the last 12 months i'll say i uh, might be close to that um, but i also noticed the service providers 
there wasn't a lot going on out there, uh, especially if you're in the, in the rig side of business of, mm-hmm. of drilling. Yeah. I mean, there was a few workovers. There might be one rig in the state of California, maybe two. Uh, but I mean, I know people that do perforating for a living, sell mud for drilling. You know, there's workover muds. I get it. But mm-hmm. the majority is chasing rigs and, and new rigs. And uh, every time I talk to them, all their focus has been out of state because there's been nothing in the state of California. So you do see some of the majors and maybe even some of the independents probably uh, uh, jumping back on the bandwagon and um, getting pretty active in the next year. Well, I've seen some drilling activity over the last year. People have been working off a backlog of permits, um, and then now we'll be reestablishing permits as well. Um, you know, I, I think the service companies, especially on the serv- well-servicing side, perforating side, you know, there's been a lot of rework activity going on. Um, a significant amount of abandonments have been happening over the last uh, couple of years. That's probably one of the things we yes. uh, created the issue that we had over in California. Is we've got an accelerated abandonment schedule that we're, we're under right now. We're trying to meet these excruciating deadlines the state has put us under. So there's been a flurry of activity on the remediation side. Um, the companies that are doing abandonments and cementing and, and that kind of stuff, perforating is involved in abandonments too, yep. sometimes for cavity shots and those kind of things. But uh you know, that side's booming and they're booked and like we have to wait weeks sometimes to get coil tubing and other things like that. So there's segments that are doing extremely well um, right now in our business and the service side. Uh, not so much drilling um, because, you know, we haven't been able to get the permits and they're just working off the inventory. But I think it will improve. I mean, my attitude is, is that we have a window to get things done and I think we need to capitalize on that window. So we're investing capital to getting wells drilled and getting that stuff done in the next two years. Until that uh, SB 1137 uh, ballot initiative hits the ballot, and I just don't think uh, we can get enough votes to beat that. So we'll probably just try you know, slide in on the radio here in the next couple of years and, and get as much stuff, stuff done as we can. So you're telling me there's a, a mandate or a law that says uh, if you have idle wells, you have so much time, or maybe there's a deadline out there that you need to uh, go in and abandon those. Yeah, no, we've got uh, basically four years to either to test – or to reactivate, okay. or to abandon, um, or get rid of our idle well inventory. So it's like 25% a year, 25, 25, 25, 25. I mean, every year, like if you have a, say you have 100 idle wells. Yep. So it's 25% a year. Wow. And, and you have to be by 50%, you have to be by 75%, you have to be by 100%. So... When even if you got if you have pricing the tanks, they still there's still there's no provision to say it's on hold. Yeah, you're spending money regardless if you're making money. So you're gonna you're gonna go lay people off so you can abandon yep. wells. Yep. I mean, people aren't gonna do that, and right. so it's it's there's no flexibility in the rules. The state's been very ambiguous about, and it's it, to me it's like ridiculous because we pass more laws in the state than we. It's like anything else. We pass more laws than we even know how to enforce or what to do with it. <laughs> it's like, well, we don't know. we got to pass a law so we can read it, right? That's just the way it works in the state. And that's the same thing with oil and gas. You know, oh, we got to pass a law for this, pass a law for that. Yep. yep. It doesn't, it, it's bad because most people in, in, in our regulatory side, just they're just not really competent. Right. No. So I've been hearing this word that I'm not familiar with, and I'm going to throw it at you, and you're going to explain it to us and to me and the listeners. Carbon capture. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it's been a buzzword and I know it's a technology and there's a process. Can you shed some light on it to me and to the listeners what carbon capture actually is? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's basically, I mean, as simple as taking the emissions, you know, emissions, which would be like, say, just take a factory and it's going to have a smokestack and taking that, those emissions and capturing them and putting them back into the ground and storing them in an underground reservoir the depleted oil and gas reservoir or something to where it's like, basically you've got these huge pore spaces under the earth. So taking that pollution and pumping the ground and that, that's something that would help the state of California, you know, meet, you know, meet its climate goals, which would be like a net zero goal. Like they think they have by, I don't know, it's 20, 40 or 50, 30 or whatever the heck it is. Okay. Well, these are, these are these uh, crazy goals that they just pick numbers out of the sky, you know, and like, we're going to get rid of fossil fuels by this date and, you know, no, none of this, no oil wells by this date, and but nobody knows how we're going to do it or what we're going to do or where we're going to roll from or how that's going to work. So, so anything that's emitting into the yeah. atmosphere, they're going to reroute and inject. That's what they're talking about in certain places. Like Kern County has got some plan, and I think I just love Kern County. I mean, Kern County is the most creative. Our planning director is by far uh, the best in the state of California, and just she is. Does it all. I mean, solar, wind, you want it, let's do it. Let's find a way to do it. Oil is our backbone. We're not giving up on it. Don't right. li- don't touch them. Right. We'll, take, we'll protect you. But she's great. She's been really creative. So she's creating, I, uh, I know I've talked to her about like an area where they can, 
you know, easily go in and, and do a carbon capture like development where okay. you're going to do, you know, insane industrial development. Where you can build a whole bunch of factories in one area and then they have a routing uh, county has to give them a route to, to do carbon capture. So it's just going to be, you know, how is it do- adopted and how the public s- sees it, if there's money in it, uh, if it's economical, if it's not. Um, there's companies that are making huge pushes towards it that you see, you know, billboards all over town now talking about it. Um, and, and I just don't know. I mean, to me, I'm not the a trailblazer when it comes to stuff. I like to see things and uh, then come in later and figure out what everybody did wrong. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, sit on the sidelines for a while. Absolutely. And um, so we'll see. We'll so see. I have a friend that's in the oil industry and he's in the service side and he told me it was kind of it is what it is. You know, he didn't, he wasn't a proponent or he wasn't against, but he says, Troy, you know what they're not going to like about it. It could increase production. It's just like injecting steam or water flood or fire flood. It's going to move oil. And uh, well, I think that's, it's true. CO2 and the and, state of California doesn't really want us to be increasing production. And so it's like double sided. It's like, we want this, but Oh, don't really want you to produce anymore. Well, there's some big fields that could really benefit from it. And many of you are familiar with elk kills. Sure. Elk kills could benefit from a CO2 flood. And I think that, yeah, it would increase production there. But if you're going to do CO2 injection, which is what you'd be doing with, with this is you, you have to redesign your whole oil field. Because casing, CO2 is a corrosive um, gas that yes. eats steel like crazy. Yep. And so where you have mature um, steam, you have chromium casing, chromium tubing, like in the Permian Basin where CO2 injection is, is prominent. And a few other places, like Black Warrior Basin, I think it's another place in the country where they do it. It's to completely redesign your oil wells. So that's going to be really expensive and, and basically, but it could give new life to, especially these lighter oil fields. Like I have a couple of light oil fields out in, mountain view area that will co2 be great to repressurize these things because you only get so people don't realize like we only recover ex- with the exception of heavy oil through steam we don't only recover like 10 to 20 percent of the oil that's in place right you know in a light light oil field which is not a steam flood right or even the rare water floods that are around Kirk County, there's very few of them you, you really just don't get the recovery and co2 could get you to the next level 20 30 percent a steam flood we've seen places in Kern County, where we recovered almost 100% of the oil in place. And then you start recovering your neighbor's oil, which is even cooler. You know, so, I mean, steam floods, we are the we are the premier place in the world for steam floods. I mean, the yes. Kern River is a perfect example yep. of a 100-plus-year field that's produced over 2 billion, I think approaching 3 billion right. barrels of oil. And we've learned how to steam better than anybody else in the world. The next, the, I mean, the next phase or next secondary or what they call tertiary um, you know, recovery is, is CO2 injection. So yeah, that would probably make people upset, but you know, we'll see. Happy you know? on one side. But they don't, they don't like solar panels either. They don't like wind. Right. You know, they call CO2 injection greenwashing. Right. They don't like nuclear, which is insane because nuclear is so cleanest energy we have clean and long life and produces very little waste. And it's just, it's, it's has safety records. Phenomenal. Right. But, you know, I just don't, we are dealing with, it really the enemy to us all, to the economy and the people of California is, is the non-governmental organizations. You think they're really protecting us, but they're not. The Sierra Club, the Center for Biological Diversity, those kind of folks are Food and Water Watch. These people are insane. I mean, what, they're, what they propose makes zero sense. We all love the environment. We all hate pollution. Sure. We all want to live in a place that's clean. Yep. We all want to be healthy. We want our kids to, to grow up in a healthy environment. This is insane. I mean, the way they're systematically shutting down our agricultural industry, our oil industry, um, I mean, eventually there'll be nothing. We can't live on organic farming in magical ways that they believe that we can. It's just impossible. There's zero economists at the Sierra Club. There's zero people when it comes to reality of how this world works. And, it, and it's constant lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. They're the biggest uh, opponent to progress. And so in this case, survival. And right. it's it just really... And they do it under auspices of things like climate change and so on and so forth where they can scare you, talk about forest fires or hurricanes or floods or whatever. I mean, they, they do things with no context. All to scare you, to catastrophize, because it's a power grab. And the government is, in California is doing that now too. It's, just, it's very frustrating to, to, to be, see climate change being used to just change and hurt and destroy so many people. Yeah, so let me just be blunt and just quite frankly ask you so 
we, if we don't have a petroleum industry in California and we're not farming, we have no power. We have no food. Where are we going to get it? We have power. Um, we, well, majority of our power is derived from natural gas, which we bring in from sure. other states. Um, we import a lot of power into California. So we're just talking about just power, but we won't have refined products. We won't have, um, we will be importing oil for fossil fuels. Um, all of our oil for fossil fuels will be um, for anything from diesels to solvents to jet. People haven't even talked about airplanes. We haven't even brought in that huge <laughs> demand of, uh, that we, that fo- fossil fuels fill, which is airplanes. And then, and anyways, even do when we do say California sticks to its guns, and they limit every fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel uh, vehicles and uh, new vehicles in the U.S. or in California, you still have 16 to 20 million oil, oil gasoline, and diesel-powered vehicles on sure. the road. Absolutely. Are you just going to have to go throw away all your cars? Right. It's not going to happen. You can't do that. So you're still going to have to need it for something. So as you shift away and, and the independent producer or the producer, is, if, it's, if they're forced out of California, you'll have to import 100% of your oil and have to – and if you shut down the refineries, you'll have to import – 100% of your refined products. You know how expensive that's going to be? That's right. Do you think $6 gas is expensive? Mm-hmm. Wait till we're boating in our gas and right. boating in our right. diesel and boating in our, the jet and, fuel. Well, and if you mandate electric in our big rig, our logistics of hauling for, out of the harbors, uh, they'll just go work in another state. Yeah. Period. Yeah. We won't have a transportation industry in California, which <laughs> we <laughs> we are a delivery of goods. What's what's insane? Like if I'm China right now, I'm just laughing. You got to be. Yeah. I'm like, gosh, darn it. You know, these guys are idiots. There, I mean, we're building, we're doing what we need to do to survive and be, you know, have a live a affordable life and be able to provide cheap energy and products. And, and that, in fact, we're selling the solar panels. They're now they're going to be so dependent on us. So that forgets depending on Saudi Arabia, they're going to depend on China for all the raw, rare earth minerals they're going to need to do build their cornucopia that they think they're going to build in California. Right. And we just went through a pandemic and we know what it's like to uh, rely on a foreign country to supply the majority of your goods. And uh, obviously, we still have backlogs and issues uh, there. And, you know, gosh. it's not going away. It's going to continue. I mean, we bought, let's try to buy six trucks. And, and it's like, we got to wait six months. I know. It's insane, man. Yeah. Sight unseen. <laughs> yeah, I can't yeah. believe it. Well, Chad, is there anything else we want to kick around regarding our uh, local uh, industry? No, I just think we need to defend our oil industry in Kern County. We need to stand up and we need to, to realize that. Uh, Oil is so much more than just fossil fuels. It powers our lives in so many different ways and provides many of the products that we need. One of the coolest things that oil does and has done in Kern County for decades is it's been a completely wealth transformational tool for people. It's taken so many people from poverty to wealth. Yep. And it's done that over and over and over again, and it continues to do that. And I think that if, if anybody or anybody talks about or threatens our industry, we need to venomous, venomously defend it. We need to stand up for it because oil is Kern County, like you said at the beginning. It's everybody. It affects everybody. And uh, we can't let them take it away. We have to talk sense into them. We have to figure it out. And Kern County has to fight. And I'll tell you again, I do appreciate your passion and your fight to defend oil in our local economy. And If we have a listener that may not be in the oil industry that maybe believes that what we're saying, or they're they're on the same page as us, uh, how do they get involved? Is there any organizations that can? Maybe someone's retired, but they still want to support the local economy through the oil industry. I mean, back in my days, I was part of the API, and I know that's still an an existing program. Mm -hmm. But is there anything or uh, groups of people that are, you know, getting together and, and trying to fight some of these and talking to your politicians and getting support? You know, we, we have trade associations and, you know, uh, the, the represent the producer, but I think the biggest thing people can do is just educate themselves. Yeah. Be smart when they're talking in a family environment, make sure they understand, just understand how much oil really means to their lives. That's the biggest thing in the world because nobody's going to vote when they really truly, if they can truly understand how important oil is to their lives. There's no way you could vote against oil. I completely agree. If you know what it does for your life, just know that without oil, you are living in the stone ages. And it's not just driving cars. Right. But people don't understand it. So just educate yourself. Yeah. Ask Google what is made <laughs> from oil. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Well said. Chad, thanks so much. We have Chad Hathaway, CEO of Hathaway LLC. Appreciate you being a friend of the show. Thank you for having me. You bet. 
The show has been brought to you by the law office of Kyle Jones, Troy Burton with the Lynn Company, CPA John Duffield, Scott Hansen Real Estate Lender, Broker and Investor, Dave Plivlich, President and CEO of the Marcom Group and MarcomBranding.com, and Amanda DiGiacomo, President of Atlas Financial Solutions. You've been listening to the Our Two Cents Podcast. Check out the show notes for links and more information about the show. Also visit our website at OurTwoCentsPodcast.com or catch us on Instagram at OurTwoCentsPodcasts. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share with others.